This morning's reading is from page 100, sorry, 1164 of our Bibles. It's taken from 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, starting at verse 6 to the end of the chapter. That's 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, starting at verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everybody else. And in their prayers, for you in their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. And so now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, first and foremost, I want to say a huge uh, thank you to you for inviting me uh, to join you today. I, I left, um, as Rebecca said, I left parish ministry uh, early this year in May. And one of the things I've been missing uh, the most is the rhythm of the church year, Sunday by Sunday, in a parish. And harvest in my previous parish uh, was always a particular uh, favourite. The services with the schools coming in, singing uh, Harvest Samba, if you know that one. Uh, the church all decked out, the harvest hymns like the ones we've sung today, and people bringing uh, their harvest gifts. At the churches I visited the last two Sundays, um, everyone has harvest on a different Sunday, don't they? So I, I miss them in those two. So I am so glad uh, to be here uh, for harvest with you today. You really have Sunnyside save the day. Thank you. Our Bible passage this morning is one of the ones that's set for Harvest uh, Sunday, uh, and I guess for an obvious reason, uh, which is that um, it links uh, with an agricultural image. Uh, to harvest uh, festival. Verse 6, uh, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And then verse 10 even refers to a harvest, albeit a rather different one. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. But there's another reason why it's a really appropriate reading uh, for Harvest uh, Festival and also I think for where uh, you find yourself in, uh, in the aftermath of Gift Day as a church family. At Harvest, we're usually involved in some collection uh, of uh, a different kind for those in need. As a diocese, we're engaged in the Bishop's Harvest Appeal and I know here you've got your local uh, collection. 
And so the other reason why this passage is really appropriate for today is that it's set in the context of a collection that Paul himself is deeply invested in, uh, namely his collection for the saints in Jerusalem. And the, the importance of that collection uh, in 2 Corinthians is often underestimated. It's not really a digression uh, within uh, the letter. In some ways, it is the whole purpose of the letter. And these two chapters, chapters 8 and 9, that deal with it are very much at the heart of it. So a little bit of context about Paul's collection. Uh, throughout his mystery, missionary journeys, Paul is collecting money from the Gentile churches in Macedonia and Greece uh, for the church, the mother church in Jerusalem. Uh, and this is in order to bring practical assistance to the believers there who were very poor and were suffering a, a great famine. But he also wanted this to be, if you like, the culmination of his ministry, a collection that would bring together very visibly uh, the Gentile church which he had labored to create uh, with the Jewish church out of which it had come, a symbol of Jew and Gentile unity. And this starts very early in the letter to the Galatians. Uh, Paul carefully lists the different visits that he made to the apostles in Jerusalem. And on his second visit, he went with Barnabas and Titus and spoke with all the apostles. And they gave Paul and Barnabas, we read, the right hand of fellowship, agreeing with his ministry to the Gentiles. But crucially, the only thing they asked was that he would remember the poor. And so throughout his journeys, throughout his missionary journeys, Paul has this on his heart uh, the poor, uh, particularly the poor church in Jerusalem. And so the first time it's actually mentioned, this collection, is in the two letters uh, to the Corinthians, uh, both written on his third missionary journey. So in the first letter to the Corinthians, written in probably about AD uh, 53, uh, towards the end of two or three years spent there, uh, and in response, um, uh, so he's in Ephesus, uh, towards the end of two or three years spent uh, there. And in response to a question uh, in the letter from the church in Corinth, uh, he writes about the collection. And we don't know how they heard about it or what they wrote to Paul. Uh, perhaps it's because he'd spoken about it when he was uh, with them or written about it in his previous letter. But in response, he tells them what they need to do before he arrives and what will happen with the collection once he does. And then before writing this letter, uh, the second letter to the Corinthians, uh, Paul is waiting in Macedonia uh, with Titus, to arrive with news from Corinth. And so when Titus finally arrives, Paul rejoices about the positive news that they, he brings about the church's response letter. However, it Paul appears from what Titus says that actually in relation to the collection, which is so close to his heart, actually the response has been disappointing. They started the collection the previous year, and then in the midst of all the trouble that had erupted and the questioning of Paul's leadership, uh, they'd sort of grown slack or even stopped it. And so here in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, Paul exhorts them to complete it. And he tells them about the unexpected generosity uh, in the meantime of the churches in Macedonia, in Philippi and in Thessalonica, who, although they were much poorer than the Corinthians, had responded eagerly with generosity. And so the second letter of the, to the Corinthians, written by, uh, carried by Titus, uh, he is accompanied by two other brothers, and Paul sends them ahead to urge the Corinthians to complete uh, the collection before he himself arrives. And then finally, this collection is mentioned uh, in the letter to the Romans, uh, even though the Roman church was not involved in it at all. Uh, he wrote uh, to Rome from Corinth uh, during his visit uh, on the third missionary journey about AD 57, and he tells them he's going to Jerusalem next, and he asks them to pray uh, for the reception of the collection uh, by the saints in Jerusalem. So this collection, which has spanned the whole of Paul's ministry, uh, involved all the churches that he's been involved in, that is the context for these verses, and particularly these verses uh, where Paul brings out some principles for Christian giving, which are still relevant to us uh, today. So coming back to this passage and its immediate context in, in chapter 8, uh, verses 1 to 15, he's argued for the resumption of the collection. And then in verses 16 to 24, he commends this three-person delegation, Titus and the two other brothers who are coming to Corinth uh, to administer it. 
and admonishes them uh, to restart uh, and complete the collection. And then in the opening verse of chapter 9, he explains why it has to be done before he arrives. Namely, that he doesn't want them to be coerced uh, by his presence as uh, their apostle uh, into giving out of pressure or compulsion. He wants them to give freely, uh, joyfully, uh, before he arrives as an expression of God's blessing in their lives. So what in the context of all that does Paul have to say about giving and, and how does that apply to us today? Well, I want to pull out uh, four brief principles of Christian giving from these uh, chapters and verses and together they spell gift g-i-f-t grace investment fun and trust grace investment fun and trust so first grace we give as a response to God's grace we give as a response to what God has done for us and what he is doing in us. So Paul encourages the Corinthians to remember all that they have received in Christ. In the previous chapter, chapter 8, verse 9, he writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he, for your sake, became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, took on the poverty of our human condition, suffered even to death on the cross for us. But not only did he do that for us, it's what he also did in us. Paul says, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Now he obviously didn't mean that through Jesus' sacrifice our bank balances would increase. He meant that through Jesus' sacrifice, we would be redeemed, we would be saved. And part of that redemption, part of that salvation, is expressed in worshipping God, here and now, including through our giving. Verse 11, you will be made rich in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. So it's a response to God's grace, what Jesus has done for us, and what he is doing in us, that as we respond in worship, we also flow out in giving to others. And the section, uh, the, both sections of 8 and 9, begin and end with reference to God's praise. And that's where our giving sits. It sits in the context of our worship of God. So that's the first thing, uh, grace. Secondly, investment. Our giving is an investment. Uh, verse 6 of chapter 9, whoever sows sparing will also reap sparing, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Of course, it's not like other investments. Uh, you can't check the paper every morning and see how your giving is going. Nor is Paul saying that if you give, you will reap a financial reward. If you actually look at what Paul says, the harvest he has in mind, verse 9, is the harvest of your righteousness. And to the extent that he talks in terms of any impact of the Corinthians giving beyond themselves, it's in terms of how other people will be inspired by their obedience and generosity. That is the harvest that is coming through this giving. Essentially, we give as an investment in God's kingdom. First, as an investment in God's kingdom in us, actually, and secondly, as an investment in God's kingdom in others. We won't always see the fruits of our investment in the short term or even in our own lifetimes. But we stand on God's word. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. As parishes in the Diocese of St Albans, as I'm sure you know, we support each other uh, through the parish share system. In my previous parish, like you here at Sunnyside, uh, we gave more to support those parishes that had less. And like you, I perhaps had no real idea what impact that made. But now as I travel around and I see a bit all the work for God's kingdom that goes on in those parishes, that would not happen without that support. 
and the encouragement it is to them to be supported in that way. It does encourage me uh, in this uh, giving as an investment in God's kingdom, even when we can't see uh, exactly what God is doing. So firstly, grace. Secondly, investment. Thirdly, my favourite, fun. Giving is supposed to be fun. Paul writes, verse 7, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. A church I attended before I was ordained used to practice hilarious giving. Uh, it was part of our annual gift Sunday. Uh, uh, there was a collection. Uh, there was a big hamper at the front of the church, and people came up and put their pledges uh, into it for the coming year. And they played everyone's favourite and most joyful hymns uh, that they could think of. And the idea was as a celebration. Actually, the, the vicar of the church, who was in his mid-60s, uh, and not a great dancer, used to dance on the stage as people did it, and people used to love that. But it certainly added to the general air of hilarity and joy. <laughs> I'm not going to do that today, just in case you're, you're wondering. But do you know what? People used to look forward to Gift Sunday. They used to look forward to Give Sunday because it had such an air of joy and celebration around it. It's like our worship. I think we'd all agree that if we all sang our hymns and songs through gritted teeth, God would not be much blessed by it. And I know that times are tough financially at the moment, but if you gave me a choice between mournful giving and cheerful giving, I think I'd choose cheerful giving every time. And so would God. So it's about responding to God's grace. It's about investing in God's kingdom. It's, it's fun. It's joyful. And then finally, it's, it's about trust, ultimately. Giving is an exp expression, maybe one of the greatest expressions, of our trust in God's future for us. Paul tells the Corinthians, verse 8, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. The real challenge with giving is always trust and trusting God. In my own experience, there have definitely been times uh, where it's been really challenging, even looked like madness uh, to give uh, what I have given. Uh, but our experience over and over again, as I'm sure yours is, is that as we trust God, we always end up having everything that we need and more. I know, as Rebecca said, you had this gift day uh, recently, and some, some of you are probably still pondering and praying about what you might give. My encouragement to you would be to pr be praying, Lord, help me to trust you more. I mean, that's a question, we, that's, that's something we want anyway, to grow in faith and trust. But as you think about that gift day, just be praying, Lord, help me to trust you more. John Wesley is one of my uh, heroes. Uh, a few years ago, I read the complete unabridged uh, diaries of John Wesley, and um, just incredibly inspiring a life and ministry. And he famously said, gain all you can, uh, save all you can, give all you can. But it's one thing to say it, and it's another thing to do it. Uh, in 1731, he began to limit his expenses so that he would have more money to give to the poor. In the first year, his income was £30, and he found that he could live on 28, so he gave away two. In the second year, his income doubled, uh, but he held his expenses even, so he had £32 to give away. In the third year, his income jumped to £90, and so he gave away £162. Sorry, £62. Pounds, sorry, my maths is a bit better than that. £62. Pounds. In his long life, Wesley's income advanced to as high as £1,400 a year. But he rarely let his expenses rise above £30. He said that he seldom had more than £100 in his possession at any time. And this so baffled uh, the English tax commissioners that they investigated him in 1776, insisting that for a man of his income he must have silver dishes that he was not paying excise tax on. He wrote to them, I have two silver spoons at London and two at Bristol. This is all the plate I have at present and I shall not buy any more while so many round me want for bread. When he died in 1791 at the age of 87, the only money mentioned in his will was the coins to be found in his pockets and dresser. 
most of the £30,000 he had earned in his life had been given away. Now, we might not all be operating quite at that level, but I think as we approach uh, this whole subject of giving in the context of this harvest, as we think about responding to God's grace, investing in his kingdom, giving joyfully, and particularly trusting God, it's just that place of where are we uh, with the Lord? Uh, where are we in relation to giving? And are we able to open our hearts so that as Paul's writing about in these verses, uh, we will see him at work to help us to grow in this grace of giving and to overflow more and more to others in generosity. Amen.